saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. This next hour, we study the gift of the inspired and true Word of God and the Word made flesh, who gives grace upon grace upon grace upon grace, and we receive that grace by Paul's words in the third chapter of Colossians. He says these words, You have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So what does that mean? Is that like hide-and-go-seek, or... He's going to reveal it later, or are we supposed to hide? How does this all look? We don't know, but we'll unpack it today. But what's great is he ends it with more Jesus. But Christ is all and in all. We'll unpack it this next hour, verse by verse. The gifts are ready for you. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Thy Strong Word is generously underwritten by our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information, lhfmissions.org. Help us, helping us to be strengthened by God's Word, we have back with us Pastor Kevin Martin of Our Savior Lutheran Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. Pastor Martin, welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Thank you. So, Pastor Martin, you've been on Thy Strong Word, or the Bible study. You've been on KFUO for quite a while. Any idea of how long you've been um, on KFUO? Oh, that's a good question. No. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think I've even done this chapter before with Will Wheaton, but I think it was a long hey, time well, ago. <laughs> did you reuse yeah. your notes, or how did you do this? Did you go back and, and use the same um, thing, or what? No, no, we just we just <laughs> dive into it and just talk about it and just see love where it. it takes us. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Well, this is yeah. our first time together, our first time together. So um, one of the things that, that, uh, that I've noticed now almost eh, not quite three months into this is that, you know, people have been on many, many times, but we have new listeners all the time. We had people from 25 different states, five different countries who are studying God's word with us, whether live or on demand. And, you know, one thing I noticed is that I don't think we've had anyone from North Carolina write in and say they've been listening. What do you think of that? Oh, wow. No, I, I know we have some people in North Carolina who tune in. There's a handful in my congregation that do, so they probably There you go. There you go. So have them they send in an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, and tell yeah. us that you're listening from or you're studying with us on KFUO for Thy Strong Word, kfuo at kfuo.org. But anyways, Pastor, as, as people are new, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the work of the saints at Our Savior? Uh, yeah, I've been uh, a lifelong Missouri Synod Lutheran. Um, I've been at Our Savior for 21 years now, and I am 29 years in the ministry. Okay. Um, so, yeah, Raleigh's lived longer in Raleigh than anywhere else I've ever lived. So it seems like home to us now. Uh, our Savior congregation was the, uh, one of the oldest churches in the Triangle area, 1942. Uh, mother church for many congregations in our circuit um, and uh, long history of church planting. Uh, our daughter churches uh, are all thriving, so it's something that we uh, uh, are glad to have been a part of. So that's kind of who we are and what we're all about. We're a small church on a small plot of land near downtown Raleigh. So realizing that there wasn't a lot of room for growth, a long time ago, they started planting churches whenever they got a full sanctuary, start a new one somewhere else. And wow. uh, that has worked. That's worked extremely well. And I think it's been a great blessing um, to our circuit and, and our synod, I think. Well, yeah. I tell you, I tell you, I tell you what. It's it's always a, a pleasure and a joy to hear of God's word being used in 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 places that I've never been. Like you know, I've never been in North Carolina. I've been in many other places in the country. And if you were to go and say, "Hey, you know, where are the most Missouri Synod churches, or where is a prominent place?" North Carolina is just not one of those. And so it's really fun to hear yeah. of not only a church being there, but the church planning that's been going on there and how God's word obviously is at work in that place. So, um, yeah, yeah, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. Any last thoughts or introductory thoughts? No, no. Uh, ready to, <laughs> okay. ready to dive in. Yeah. All right. And well, Bible you study is something that we do in our Go congregation. Ahead. We, uh, 
get a we get a good crowd out for Sunday morning Bible study, pick a book of the Bible, go through it. So it's been kind of a hallmark of our congregation as well. So fits, well, the, the thy strong word fits in with what I do every Sunday. So I enjoy that. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, hopefully after this, you'll then start Colossians. After you, whatever you're done with you have now, you'll start the book of Colossians. Oh, yeah, no, I, I'm starting Ma- I just finished Ezekiel last Sunday. We're starting Matthew this Sunday. Okay, all right, all right. So, later on, Sunday later on. So how about this? We'll start our time in prayer. Can you begin us in prayer, Pastor? Yes, let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. We pray that as you promised, that you would set our minds on those things that are above, where Christ our Lord is seated at your right hand in glory. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Reminder to everyone that is listening, if you have any questions concerning our text today, drop us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, kfuo at kfuo.org. Also, if you're listening in North Carolina, send us an email and give us a reminder that we are um, hearing God's word in that great state. Um, Pastor, on Tuesday, uh, we kind of flew through chapter two. We've been greatly blessed with wonderful guest, uh, Dr. Paul Dieterding, who wrote the commentary on Colossians to begin us off, and Dr. Elaine Berglund really dug deep, and we talked about the preeminence of Christ in chapter one, and, and we had John Lukomsky as we talked about chapter two. It felt so quick, and, and, and today it starts with, if then, or other translation says, therefore, so clearly there's a lot of stuff that comes up before this and during this. So do you have any introductory or contextual thoughts as to help us out this morning? Oh, well, um, with with the, the illustrious guests that have preceded me, I doubt there's much that I could add. <laughs> to, it's it's to, humbling, isn't it? That. It's humbling. <laughs> it is, yeah. It's a little it's a little intimidating. So uh I I wouldn't think I'd have anything in particular except um, that these first few verses are uh, very interesting. The whole idea of our lives being hidden with Christ in God is yeah. something that you don't really find Paul spending a great deal of time on that here directly, and you really struggle a little bit to find uh, a similar passage elsewhere in his writings. So I find this chapter is one that... Um, is 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 worth contemplating what that means because this is a little bit different, a little bit different thought uh, for Saint Paul, um, and I would think it has something to do. I'm sure your previous guest talked about it about how he's clearly the, uh, the Colossian congregation is obviously has some Neoplatonic philosophers running around in the congregation yeah. as we spend a lot of time you know, the warning in the last chapter about not being captivated by philosophy and empty deceit. Um, So I kind of wonder, it seems to be, the congregation seems to be marked by a kind of Hellenistic, philosophical, Greek outlook. And Paul's Mm -hmm. trying to wean them off that. And as a philosophy major in college, of course, this has always been a chapter that I come to and go, hmm, Maybe it wasn't such a good idea to be a philosophy major. <laughs> so, well, that's fascinating. Kind of oh my! To me personally, yeah, 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 and that's and that's very helpful. Um, I think this is helpful in two ways. Is the first the first way is that first of all you're admitting that when we go to God's Word, and this is good for you, our listeners, is that when we go through God's Word, that there's always new gems to find. That, that you obviously had read before, but God works through his word and we grow in faith and the Holy Spirit's at work and it shows us different things. But then there are times too where you're like, I, I don't fully understand this. I don't fully, like the Colossian heresy. I mean, talking to Dr. Dieterding and, and all this, that there's still just a lot of conjecture of what was the problem there? What was, what did Epaphras mm. experience and go to Paul? Uh, I heard uh, 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 Pastor Brian Wolfmuir talk about Colossians, and one of his comments was, it was almost like Epaphras was there. He's kind of doing some circuit riding. He's going to uh, Aeropolis, and, and he's going to these places, and he's like, there's something here, and I don't fully understand this. So he goes to his 
you know, his father confessor or his uh, uh, the vicarage bishop or whatever you want to call him to Paul. And it's like, I just can't quite put my thumb on this Colossian heresy. And so is it Gnosticism? As you said, is it, you know, Platonic issues? There's a lot of questions that we still have. It doesn't make the, the text any less true. But there's a lot of questions that we still have, and we leave it at the Lord's feet and, and say, Lord, help us to understand. Uh, that's very helpful as you brought that up. As Even as a philosophy major, you're admitting you don't know at all. This is good. <laughs> no, but I, I mean, I suspect that, that that verse, that our life is hidden with Christ and God, there's probably some tie-in to the philosophical concerns there. And it does mm-hmm. sound like Neoplatonism, which was, uh, related to Gnosticism, not quite as bad as out and out Gnosticism, but still sure. kind of problematic. Sure. And it seems like he's trying to work with this and turn it towards Christ to kind of baptize it. Like Augustine said, we plunder the Egyptians, you know, because Plato, Aristotle had a couple ideas that are, you know, kind of not way, way off, off the mark. And <laughs> yeah, Paul sure. seems to be doing that a little bit. You know, instead of just saying, hey, you're wrong, think this way, he's like, okay, well, you know, well, like he quotes in Acts on the Areopagus, you know, that we are all his offspring, as one of your poets has said. And instead mm-hmm. of just straight condemning it, he takes the thought, and then he spins it back towards Christ and the cross and the gospel. Oh, that is, so, that I don't is know, wonderful. just a thought. That wonderful. It, maybe that's what he's doing here. But yeah, we would love to know. I mean, all his epistles are really like one side of a phone conversation, aren't they? They are. They and are. So you really like to know who the other side was. I know. Oh, it'd be so great. It'd be so great. But let's dig into it then. If it was um, good for us, we wouldn't. So, yeah. Th- that's in. true, too. Yeah, then we would, we would think we knew it all, and then we'd become our own gods. But that's another yeah. conversation. So let's go verses 1 and 2. Reminder to our listeners that we are reading from the English Standard Version of this Holy Scriptures. And open up your Bible. Uh, the gifts are ready, and let's get started. Chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. We'll start there, and then we'll dig into this, Hidden with Christ. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not hidden on that are on earth. Excuse me, we haven't got there yet. Verse 2, verses 1 and 2. I wanted to refocus on verse 1 because uh, we talk about this in Galatians. Uh, we had people talk about this, and we see it here in Colossians a lot as a very high Christology that Jesus was not a, a happy, clappy best friend or your baseball coach. He was the almighty God. He was the image of God, not like God. He was God. Paul very much so proclaims that truth here and speaks about being raised with Christ. What are the things that you notice in verse 1? Well, just uh, as you said, that um, this is not Jesus, my friend, Jesus who helps me. Um, have a better day, helps me get ahead at work, helps me be a better dad. Um, mm-hmm. This is Christ who is the all-ruling. I mean, this is the, uh, well, the famous icon, Christos Pantocrator, that we see in the early church, far and away the most common, that pictures him as the exalted Lord, true God, true man, reigning over all creation. So, if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. It's reminding us that to confess that Jesus is Lord is to say that Jesus is God, not God-like, not he was God for a while, he had a high God consciousness. No, Jesus is God, and God is always the man Jesus, ever. And, and 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 forever. And I think this is something that everybody says, oh, yeah, we know that. But believing that the man Jesus is the eternal and almighty God is a tougher thing <laughs> for is. lifelong Christians than I think we give it credit for. And mm-hmm. I suspect this is the Colossian problem. I mean, we'll never know for sure. It's speculation. But I think they're just trying to paint Christ as some kind of demiurge or, you know, quasi-God or godlike being or uh, the, the wisdom of God or something like that, and they're just having trouble. No, the man Jesus is God. As Luther says, you're going to put down God for me? You have to put down the man Jesus. There is no other God but him. So 
I I kind of think that's he's getting to the crux of what he's writing about. You know, usually the first couple chapters in his epistle does some preliminaries, and I think here this is kind of the central passage, and he's getting off his chest his concern. Well, and, and it affirms the, the words Jesus like God. Yeah, that in the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. I mean, this, bodily. I was thinking, bodily, yeah, there's this wonderful bodily. incarnational talk, and uh, uh, it doesn't have, like in Philippians, you have this understanding of the humiliation and exaltation of Christ, but here, mm-hmm. I mean, he's just going all out showing who Christ is without any doubt, and he's not, like you said, he's not attacking them and saying, you believe this, mm-hmm. but you're wrong. This is the truth. But he's just right. even more clearly proclaiming the truth and creedally, right? I mean, this is where we get part of the creed at the right hand yeah. of God, showing where the, his authority yeah. lies. Yeah. 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 Oof. Yeah. Well, no, I think, I, I think I, we're good. I, I think we should shower up. We're yeah, good. We got it all figured out. <laughs> but the no, part, okay. if, if you were raised with Christ, the if then, okay, mm-hmm. that's interesting. You know, it's not like. You were raised with if then you were raised with Christ. So there's a little there's a little making them go, Have I been? <laughs> when right. when did that happen? Oh yeah. In baptism. I mean there's a part Paul is kinda like, You are Christians, right? You know, it's sort of like Jesus does with the apostles. Who do men say that I am? Oh, Elijah, maybe a prophet. Now who do you say that I am? Uh, the Christ of God? Really? Do you mean that? Do you really believe that? <laughs> you know, I guess Paul's kind of doing the same thing. You were raised with you're a Christian, right? You you were raised with him, you died with him and, and you're raised with him, right? And it's just kind of making them own it, making them confess it, making them say, Yes, I am a Christian. Wow, almost by uh, asking, by asking the question, giving an answer by asking the question, leading you forward. Um, I'm thinking about this because we, we know, we sang the song, My Song is Love Unknown, which is a great yeah. hymn that basically is <laughs> asking questions the whole time. <laughs> and I never, yeah. I, was, I was singing that last night. I was like, wait, we're just asking questions. And it's you're, you're answering, you're giving a proclamation by asking questions in that sense. And you, you, you know the answer, you know. My song is love unknown, right. you know, and it's like, wait, this is the love right. of God. And that's what he's doing here, too. If then you've been raised with Christ and it's like, wait, OK, what did he say in chapter two again? I mean, not they didn't have chapters then, but yeah. saying, you know, you died in Christ and you've risen with him right. in your baptism. So he's he's leading them. He's been, you know, I never thought but he's being very pastoral and very patient with the Colossians yes. and what they're dealing with. He's pulling them into making the great confession. You know, he's he's because they're like, wait, wait, I, I want to be a Christian. Yes, I, I, I have been raised with Christ. Kind of right. pulling that out of them. Wow. I remember, I think it was a weird New York performance artist, Laurie Anderson, had a in, a in a weird song once. She said, you know, what is the Star Spangled Banner after all, except a lot of questions that somebody had at a fire? <laughs> <laughs> you know, most countries right. are like, our country is great because we did this and we did that. And we're so wonderful. So, But our national anthem isn't like, oh, America is so great, you know, and all this. It's like, is that a flag over there? Is it still flying? And in a way, it does the same thing Paul's doing here. It makes you say, yes, that's our flag. I'm an American. You know, I'm part of that. Wow. If you were raised with Christ, wouldn't you be seated? Yes, I was raised with Christ. I'm a Christian. It's pulling a confession out of you, I think. Wow, that's a good point. I, I never really thought about it that way. Now, now the first verse, we it's pulled out of us. We've we've proclaimed this well. I'm excited. My identity is in Christ. Uh, um, see, and it says here in verse one and two, seek the things that are above and set your minds on things that are above. So he is definitely yeah. pointing our eyes up. What is he? What is he pointing us to? Seeking, setting, looking up. What is he saying? Well, I mean, it's the resurrection, because if you are raised with Christ, so we're thinking about the resurrected Christ. But as Paul says back in Corinthians, which is, I think, floating in the background, that the one thing that he's resolved to know and proclaim everywhere he goes is the crucified Christ. Mm -hmm. So the one who is raised and reigns at the right hand of God 
is the crucified one. It is as the crucified one because he's been raised from the dead. He's the one who died on the cross and rose again. And as the crucified one, he reigns. As we're coming into Holy Week starting on Sunday, you know, the one thing that he retains of the halls, you know, that's how the disciples recognize him is the wounds in his hands and his feet and his side. So you're setting your mind on the one who died and rose. Um, Luther says this somewhere. So he's not setting their mind on a God who is, you know, a pure spirit. Uh, he's setting their minds on the one who was the crucified carpenter, who turns out to be the one who reigns over heaven on earth. So setting your mind on things above, paradoxically, kind of sets your mind on the cross and the one who descended and in whom all the fullness dwelt in his body. Hmm. And it reminds me a little bit of the John John 3 passage that we had that connected us to the Old Testament. Yeah. As Moses lifted up yeah. the servant in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must yeah. be lifted up. Yeah, yeah. As they the, look to the serpent the cr- to be healed. Mm-hmm. And this is where he's sort of playing with him, I think, a little bit. He's like, you are philosophers, you want to set your mind on heaven? Well, the one who reigns in heaven is the one who is buried in the heart of the earth and crucified. So you're kind of like, well, to lift my mind up is first to go back down into the depths of the cross and the tomb with him. And Which might get us on to what it means in the verse 3, because you died. If you want to set your minds on things above, you've got to set your mind on death, the death of Christ, right. that he died for you, and that you died in your baptism. So if you want to float on the clouds... You've got to sink down into the depths with Jesus. You've got to find the cross to find your hidden life. In waiting up there in some Neoplatonic, you know, spiritual world floating on the clouds, it's it's hidden in the tomb. It's hidden in your baptism. I'm getting ahead though. Sorry. No, you're getting yeah, you're getting excited. I mean, this is exciting for all of us because I was I was thinking that too. Is you you look up to the cross, you look up to heaven. And the hard part is you realize, wow, you know, that's that's great stuff. But then you start to realize who you are, <laughs> that all of yeah. this, kind of like you said with, oh, I got Dr. Dieterding. And maybe I shouldn't start that way when I started a radio program. By the way, we had all these great guys. <laughs> now, what do you have? I, really I apologize. Do you have anything to add to that? No, no, it's all good. It's all good. Exactly. Yeah, and you realize all, how playing on the valuable. Same team. It's right. Yeah, how valuable we really are. And you realize that I this needs to die. I need a new man. I need a new person. I need I need someone to resurrect me, which we'll get to later on here. And 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 he's definitely pointing us in that direction to show us who Christ is and to make us how could we look at Christ and say, Oh, I'm worthy. Oh, I'm worthy because of me. No, I'm right. worthy because of him. Yeah. So right. any last thoughts on the first two verses? No, no, no. All right, let's move on. Verses 3 and 4, and we'll get to the hidden question. Here we go. Since you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Oh, excuse me. For you have died, I'm sorry. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So he doesn't ask the question. I kind of said it this way. Uh, If you have died or have you died, no, you have died. And then your life is hidden with Christ. I wanted to, right. you talked about this before, and I want to unpack a few words that you've said, just to make sure our listeners, that you, our listeners, are on the same page. When you say ne- Neoplatonic, what does that mean? Hmm. Um, Porphyry and Plotinus will like, uh, I mean, who are like second, third century Greek philosophers. In the first century, um, the dominant culture there's lots of different Greek philosophies going on, but what engages most of the thoughtful people is some attempt to merge Plato and Aristotle. Because mm-hmm. while Plato was Aristotle's teacher and they were both disciples of Socrates, they're very different in a lot of ways. And for reasons that are a little bizarre, and the Jewish synagogue was very wrapped up in reconciling Plato and Aristotle with the Old Testament, Um, and the Christian Mm. fathers would continue in that direction. So Neoplatonism, New Platonism, is trying to merge Plato 
and Socrates into one coherent philosophy. Hmm. Um, and Plato thinks that the only things that are real are the forms, which are the ideas that exist in the mind of God, and the material world is just sort of a shadowy embodiment of that. Now, Aristotle goes, no, I think that the, the bodies are real, and what makes them what they are is the heavenly substance or form that dwells in each person. So trying to figure out what that looks like and how that works is is kind of a, a background philosophy in the first century that you're going to find in the synagogues. And a lot of the Greeks who, who come in Colossae is a very Greek town. They're probably going to be dabbling this in, in some way or another. It's a little more sophisticated than the Gnosticism that is popular yeah. in other areas. So I'm thinking that, that this is this is a little bit of a background because Plato and Socrates and Aristotle can have some ideas about, you know, heaven and eternal life and the vision of God as being the goal that you can work with. But they also have some real problems because they can't see how the death on the cross could lead you to anything spiritual. Socrates' whole idea is that the body has to be shucked off, that we are trying to escape the, the material world and become pure spirit. So this is where I think Paul's like, you want to you want to be exalted? You want to rise up spiritually to heaven? Well, you've got to sink down into the grave, into the cross, with the crucified body of Jesus. Then there's a sacramental aspect there, too, because just like we're baptized into his death, so we eat and drink his crucified body and the blood that he shed there on the cross. So he's kind of trying to lift them up by bringing them down to <laughs> yeah, earth. Yeah, yeah. With Jesus. Him, so yeah. that's where I think the Neoplatonism background is where Paul, who is a very sophisticated thinker, is using where his audience is at and trying in paradoxical ways to move them to a complete reliance on Christ and him crucified and to be done with philosophy, to be to move on and to find sufficiency in Christ in the word. That it is Christ who is our wisdom. I think that's where yeah. uh, we need to take our break yeah. right now. But I want to touch more on this because, folks, we have gotten into Neoplatonism and Gnosticism and everything else that we've heard. How much more excited could you be for the next portion? So let's take our break. We are studying Colossians chapter 3 with Pastor Kevin Martin. We'll be right back. The Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, on behalf of Concordia Plan Services, Lutheran Housing Support Corporation, Concordia University System, Lutheran Church Extension Fund, the LCMS Foundation, and Corporate Synod, daily reaches out to our members and partners, working together to support our local, global, and international ministries, church workers, and LCMS initiatives at large to carry the mission forward and to serve each other in love. Opportunities to serve, lcms.org slash careers. And welcome back. We are studying Colossians chapter 3 with Pastor Kevin Martin. And as we are uh, slowly going through these verses, we are definitely hearing the reality of, of the town of Colossae, that they're, they're struggling with certain ideologies, which is no different than today. There's ideologies thrown at us at every direction, um, different ideas, philosophies that are not pointing us back to Christ. And that's exactly what Paul does. And that's what we need to do. So he has said, seek the things that are above, which is Christ. Set your minds on things that are above. Uh, Christ and him crucified, the resurrected Jesus. For us, we have died because we need to die in order to be risen. And our life is hidden with Christ in God. So let's kind of dig into that a little bit, Pastor Martin. You kind of made, made it very clear that this is kind of a very important piece. Hidden with Christ in God. What is Paul telling us here? So that um, both Neoplatonism and Gnosticism are philosophies of knowledge and understanding of divine and spiritual mysteries. 
So he's he's when he says your life is hidden with Christ in God, it's a way of using a familiar category for for them, but kind of inverting it. For them, knowledge promises that the mysteries are revealed. There's nothing hidden. Everything's above board. But Paul's like, no, you see, because we've died with Christ, our real life is not going to be seen the side of the grave. It's only going to be at the resurrection when we behold Christ face to face that we will see who we really are and what our life is really like. Uh, so this earthly life is living with that that mystery and looking at the things that can be seen, the cross, the word, the sacraments. So for people who are captivated by philosophy, as the Colossians seem to be, this would be both intriguing and challenging at the same time. So he's, he's kind of meeting them where they're at and sort of luring them into the tomb with Christ and right. setting their mind on the life that is to come and and kind of dampening expectations. You know, Plato, Socrates, the Gnostics, hey, we'll reveal all truth, all knowledge. You know, we'll tell you what it is. Paul's like, no, but I, I can tell you where, you know, you should look. I can tell you, you know, where and how your life will be revealed, and it will be with Jesus in the resurrection. Okay, so... I want to take another step back because this is really, really important for us, especially when we start getting into verse five. Is that what I'm, what I'm, what I'm interpreting this, and I want you to verify or say, no, you're way off. Is this understanding that they have this understanding of Neoplatonic, Neoplatonic, Platonic, um, and Gnosticism understanding that you can fully understand yourself. Now, like you can find all your identity, you can find it inside and in knowledge and all of this. And he's saying, no, 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 you can't find it there. You will find it at the final resurrection. But right now, what you yeah. can find is your identity in Christ. And he's died and he has risen and you need to die and to look to him to find your identity. Is that, exactly. am I in the right direction? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's yeah. exactly it. And for people who yearn to know, the the, 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 the the true mysteries of the universe, Paul is feeding on that desire, but he's directing it in a completely different place than any Greek philosophy or religion would teach them to look. Oh, and great. Greeks have a tough time with paradox. You know that the king of the universe is the one who died as a lowly carpenter on a cross as a Roman criminal. I mean, these, these are tough things for a Greek person to wrap their head around, tough things for modern Americans to wrap our heads around as well. We look for the glorious in the things that are obviously good and glorified, and, and, and glorified. but Christ, you know, and a crucified king, this is, this is tough for them. And then he'll kind of invert it a little bit in verse 5 when we get there. Right. And one of the passages I was thinking about as, as you're saying this is, but our citizenship is in heaven from Philippians chapter three, and we await a savior yeah. because he'll take our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. I mean, this is where exactly. um, in, 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 in these other philosophies, death you've lost. And, and this is how I'm thinking about it right now. Death you've lost. And we stand there at a funeral and we give the hope to say, no, this lowly body will be like God's glorious body someday when Jesus returns. Exactly. That that is where our citizenship is in. Um, not glorifying death, but glorifying the God who will raise this body. This boy, this connects it perfectly as we think about our daily walk with our Lord Jesus. Last thoughts on oh, these first four verses. Yeah, that there's also a strong gospel component to this because yeah. Greek religions, philosophies, mystery religions, along with Hellenistic synagogue life, is very legalistic. It's very self. You have to transform yourself. Okay. You've got yeah. to do this through arduous self-discipline, um, philosophical practices, religious rites and ablations. But here, it's something that only God can do for you. He is the one who makes you a new person, and he does this paradoxically by first baptizing you into Christ's death. He kills in order to make alive. And so that's, well, that's, that's a big hurdle. 
yeah. <laughs> and that's and that's an interesting <laughs> dynamic to this. Yeah, who wants to be put to death? Who wants to? Well, who wants to repent? Right. You know, who wants to admit that you are wrong? I mean, nobody does. Um, um, but it is through that that our Lord gives us resurrection. And then he in verses five and six, and the rest of our time yeah. really is he's pointing us back to that. Okay, you have set your things on, you set your mind above. You've died in Christ. Now there's things you need to put aside. There's things that need to die in your life. You need to move them over there so that you can yes. look above. Um, uh, let's move on. Five and six. Five and yeah. six. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Well, if that if that's not law, I can't think of law any differently, right there. And and it definitely oh, it is pointing is. us to some very important words, some very important imperatives. And Doctor Dieterling writes this that they're grounded in the indicatives that since you've died in Christ and that's your identity, now therefore do this. Um, first thoughts on these verses. Yeah. Well, so the one thing that, uh, and, and Neoplatonism along with Gnosticism are alike in this, that they view the body as just inferior, dirty, and finally irredeemable. The hope of salvation for a Greek person, whether you're a Gnostic, a Stoic, or a Platonist or an Aristotelian, is to escape the material and to flee into the purely spiritual. So oddly enough, fornication, immorality, drunkenness, because the body's nothing, it's irre irredeemable, we're going to get rid of it anyway, the, uh, the high-minded Greek philosopher would think nothing of engaging in sexual immorality, evil desires, covetousness, because the body's just nothing. So Paul's saying, okay, if you really want to escape what is truly deadly and yucky, Stop with the sexual immorality. Stop with the impurity. Put to death the passion and the evil desires and the covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. So they're, 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 kind, of, they're kind of antinomians, really. They're like, oh, as long as I believe in Jesus, it doesn't matter what I do. I can have a good time on earth, and he'll come and transform my body. And Paul's like, not exactly. He and he alone will transform your body. But already, because you've died with him, the indicative, this has already happened in baptism. How can you carry on as if the body is not a temple of the living God, and as if it too will not be raised and glorified as Christ is bodily glorified? So he's making our bodies just as important as our soul, which is a mind-blowing idea for you know, philosophically-minded Greek people. It's kind of it's kind of cool how he does that. You know, you're eager to shuck off the mortal coal. Well, you can start right now. Okay, you right. can you can be faithful to your wives. You can be pure. You can put away evil desires, and covetousness. You can be generous, humble, kind-hearted, and pure. And and this is it's very interesting because when I look at First Corinthians chapter six. He doesn't say these same words, and I'm seeing a lot of parallel with how he's speaking in chapter 3 and 1 Corinthians. Seeing mm, a lot of parallel. Definitely. And and definitely. here, he doesn't say it, but he, he definitely is implying it. For you are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Um, yes. And he, he's speaking that way, definitely put to death, in, and therefore you're glorifying God with your body when you put to death these things. And, and this is and this is important for our culture. And I'm I want to hear your thoughts on this. Is how much of this is part of our culture today? This understanding of of uh, well, our bodies are kind of not worth much of anything anyway. So we may as well do whatever right. we want with them while we're here on this earth. Whatever Any thoughts want. on how that relates to today? Yeah, no, it's very much it's very much a part of our culture. We partake in the same kind of Gnosticism and uh, spiritualism, um, so that, well, the body, you know, it's just going to die and rot in the ground. And, you know, the belief that our bodies, these physical bodies are resurrected, uh, I always 
quiz new catechumen. So like Jesus was only human for 33 years and they put his body aside, went away to being a pure spirit. That's what's going to happen to us. Right. I usually get about 60 percent of the new catechumens go, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I've always thought. (laughs) <laughs> like, no, 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 that's not what's going to happen. And uh, Professor Dieterding and the indicatives is really important insight. You mm-hmm. have died with Christ and Christ was raised, not just spiritually, but bodily. He was raised and your bodies, these mortal bodies, God is going to glorify as he's glorified Christ's body. So since you've already died, the renovation is already taking place, and you can participate in the joy of that by putting away evil desire, covetousness, fornication, idolatry, because God hates those things, and because you're gods, you hate them too. You know, you don't want to live mm-hmm. like that anymore, and you're right. It's very much like the Corinthians. I, I picture the Colossians as like Boston, okay, a lot of universities, a lot of eggheads, and sure. Corinth is like New York City, like a lot of hedge fund managers, Wall Street guys. But it's the same basic philosophy. It just plays out in slightly different ways. So, I'm starting to wonder what, what Minnesota is in this whole thing. You know, what, what is what is, is Minneapolis St. Paul or <laughs> you know, how does that relate? Know, maybe, well, we're not Boston. <laughs> maybe Min- Maybe Minnesota is more like Galatia, I think. Uh, I'm thinking maybe it's more more God's oh, country, you know? There you go. Colossae. There you yeah, go. Colossae is not Boston. Colossae is San Francisco. It's pure California. <laughs> yeah. We could talk this all day. Is Magic this is Crystals this. and Shirley oh, MacLaine. Geez. Yeah. Yeah. No, all right. Paul, well, Paul is engaging the here that the body is as redeemed as the soul. And this is a tough idea for people who are captivated by Greek philosophy of the time and by people who are kind of new agey uh, uh, today. Yeah. And that's something that is, is, I mean, it's very much so a reality for our day to day because we will look at these passages and, and, and I know I've, you know, I've dealt with this a lot when growing up and then also as a pastor now with, with young people and what you watch on TV. And there's kind of this understanding of, well, these not only there, there's kind of like a hidden message here where when he says sexual morality, what he really means is this. You know, when it's, when he says impurity, he doesn't really mean, you know, that you uh, that it has anything to do with sexuality. It has something to do with else or passion or covetousness and all that. Well, that's really something else. It's almost like you're searching for a, a hidden knowledge right. behind it because we're trying to justify right. the physical things that we're doing. And, and well, this yeah. is very important for us to I'd glorify to God. Stop doing that stuff. And surely I can't, don't have to stop doing that stuff. It's not like I actually right. can participate in Christ's holiness now, can I? Right. Yeah. And there's a, a feeling of, I can't control it. And that's why I think right. it's a good move for us in verse 7, because he speaks yes. about something that's very important for us. Verse 7. In these you two once walked when you were living in them. And this is important for us because it also points us to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, when he goes down the list of, of similar issues in, in, uh, Corinth, in Corinth, excuse me, and, and, and the same in Colossae, as he says, and such were some of you. And, and this yeah. is where we have to remember that we can control these things. We can, I want to say overcome is the right word, and I'm even comfortable saying control, but we can move forward from these physical things that tempt us. We can move forward from, and he'll even go into this a little bit later, from, from speaking lies and slander and all these things, say, well, I can't control it. What matters is what's on my heart. No, he says, you can control this. You can glorify God right. in this, but you were washed, as he says, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, he says, you have been, you, you've died in Christ and risen to new life. You can do this because you have almighty God on your side. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's a very, Paul is a very Walfarian law gospel preacher, but he blends it in. <laughs> gospel law, he gospel does. law. He's like, God is mad at that stuff. The people who've done that, the wrath of God is coming. You're like, oh no. And he's like, but you know what? You you were that way once. You once walked that way when you were living in them. But now verse eight. But now you can put it all away. 
okay? Because back to the indicatives, you've already put it away. You've already died with Christ. Let that life of his be yours, and it can start now. Good news. It's not a have to, or you're not going to make it to heaven. It's a get to, because you've already died with him, because you've already been seated with him in the heavenly places. This is how you get to live. And your body is worth a lot more than you think it is. And and that is something that God also created good, very good, and took on himself. So it, it's a way of, of very positively luring them into a more Christ-like life as a get-to, not have-to. And that's why I'll move on to the next two verses, because before anybody, and we have this claim today that we talk about, all you want to do is talk about sex. You want to talk about we can't have any fun. And and that's all you guys talk about, even though that's not true nowadays. Um, But it is something like, oh, you're just making us feel bad about ourselves. Like, no, there's other things that we all have. And it it puts us all on the same level playing field. But, you know, whether you are old or young or whatever, there's other things that we all are battling and need in the Lord Jesus' help, and need to be reminded of our indicatives with these imperatives. Verses 8 and 9. Right. But now you must be put, you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with his practices. I want to stop there for this, for this reason, is yeah. to focus on these words yeah. a little bit. What is he telling them here? Yeah, so he's saying, look, um, you once walked that way um, when you were living in them, but now you have to put them away. The anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, which really kind of mirror the sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, covetousness, maybe getting them a little more specific. And don't lie to each other, okay? Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. So he gets back to the imperatives are always grounded in the gospel indicative because you already have put these things away. Because just when you're going like, oh, I'm never going to be able to do that. okay? I guess I'm really not going to measure up in the Christian club. I'm going to have to drop out. Paul's no, no, no. You have already put these things away when you were baptized with Jesus. He's put these Mm -hmm. things away. And Mm -hmm. it's a way they go, really? I have? Yes, you have. It's just a trick of the devil to make you think you can't overcome these things. You have no control over them. They control you. No. Christ guides you. He leads you. He has gifted you with this. You already can reflect his freedom from these things, which at the end of the day, he says elsewhere, you know, what what do we have to the Galatians when we walked in those things? You know, was that any fun? You know, was that joy? No, it's something of which we're ashamed. Well, you're free of that. Christ has done this. You've already put off that old man to which, you know, you can see him alternating between, oh, no, there's no hope for me. I did those stuff. Oh, wait, but wait a minute. But Jesus has already taken it away. Tell me more about that. As it says in verse eight, but now today is a new day. Yeah. You were washed. You were sanctified. <laughs> it's, it's a new day. It reminds yeah. me so much of, of Zacchaeus, you know, that, that, you know, he calls him down from the yeah. tree. Great song. Great kid song. It's always <laughs> memorable. And and it the part that's, so I think, the most myself. yeah is the most powerful is that Jesus goes to his house. Um, he And he says at the end, today salvation has come to this house. That's what I, I felt like when I read verse 9, or verse 8. But yeah. now, but now, now is the day that you are saved, you know. Um, you have you been have raised with Christ. Off. You have put off. You put it off in all its practices. You may not know it. You may not always feel that way, but that's the truth. I'm telling you the truth. Jesus has done this for, in, and with you. And look at this, too, where he talks about, and put them all away. It reminds me of, uh, as a kid, I'd go to my grandmother's house. She she was on a farm. And and you would just go, and you'd get in the mud. Now thinking back to it, I was probably a lot of bacterial issues in that mud because we're on a farm, and who knows what was in that mud. But anyways, I remember you get there, and you would take that, take the boots off you had to keep them outside of course and you you you, you took off the muddy stuff and 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 you you knew you could do it and and it's almost like paul's telling them here you can do this 
Put it all away. Yes, is it going to be hard? Yes. Um, don't lie to one another. Don't do any of those things. Goes back to catechism talk. Um, put off the old self. And he has reminded us of the gospel indicatives that these imperatives are something that God calls us to and who's going to be with you every step along the way. Our Lord Jesus, who has taken it all upon himself. Pastor, we have about done. six it's minutes. Indicative. Yeah. It's indicative, sure. yeah. It's, it, we have about six minutes left here, and I want to make sure we get to these next two verses, but just for a little yeah. bit, any last thoughts on these verses so far? No, no. <laughs> okay, here we go. Let's get to I'm the ready end for here. 10, 10, 11. 10, 11. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. All right, so he starts at the beginning. Put on a new self. Why is this important that he says this right away, the new self? Well, because the indicative that we had ended with seeing you have put off the old self and have at the same time put on the new self. See, because for a lot of people, you can think, oh, well, I can, you know, repent and I can be sorry for what I was, but then how do I become good? And Paul is the good news here that the putting off of the old self, the hating of the garment stained by sin is already putting on the new one. It's one and the same move. It's two sides of the same coin. It's not two steps in a 12-step process, okay? It's mm -hmm. the single step. That once we are vexed and once we're like, oh, man, I did all that stuff, the impure language and thoughts and all that, I did live that way. All right, well, okay, already remorseful and repentant, you put off the old self, and that's the same thing as putting on the new. Because that's the new you going, oh, man, I don't want to live that way anymore. Well, good news, you don't have to. You're already being renewed in knowledge, which here is redefining knowledge for philosophers. Knowledge is not knowing the names of the seven angels and the demiurges or, you know, getting down all the forms and the relationship to substance. Knowledge is knowing Jesus crucified and risen for our life and salvation. It's knowing him. It's knowing a person. It's not abstract. It's not metaphysical. It's not hard. You don't have to read a lot of books. It's just knowing the person who is our Savior and our Creator who loves us. And if you know him, all of these good things are already going on in you because he's doing it. Put off the muddy clothes and you and Christ puts on his robes of his righteousness upon you. That is uh, my my thought with this. And Galatians 3 yeah. says, as many were baptized into Christ, Jesus have put on Christ. I mean, this is not a, oh, okay, so it's a transaction. I do this and then Christ puts himself on me. No, it is Christ who puts himself on you. Uh, repent. This is yeah. who you are. You have died in Christ. This is your identity. Um, and I think about this too, Pastor, is this Sunday for Paul. Palm Sunday is our confirmation Sunday. And I love, although oh, okay. there's, a, there's a lot of questions about the, you know, do they wear the, do they wear the gowns? Do you not? And, you know, I, I kind of struggle with that sometimes, but overall I love it because I can just totally say, you can't tell even, you know, what, who this, who this kid is completely because they're covered in white and that's who we are. And that's what I envision this hidden with Christ imagery is what you can see is white. What you see is Jesus. What you see is forgiven. What you see is all that he's done for us. There's no Greek. There's no Jew. There's not all this. It's Christ no. all and in all. That's, that's what I'm excited about confirmation this Sunday. And all those categories too for ancient people. You know, we pride ourselves on, you, know, you can be whatever you want to be. You know, we're socially mobile. Well, there was no social mobility in the first century. We're in an empire world. If you were born a slave, you'd stay a slave. You know, if you were a barbarian, you were always going to be a barbarian. And the notion that when you go, oh, these muddy clothes stink, I'm going to take them off, and you feel like you're going to be naked. But when you rip off those old clothes, you find that there's a new suit of clothes that Jesus has already clothed you with, with his righteousness. You're not naked. You're clothed in him. And that means that Jew, Greek, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. No, you're Christian. 
that's your identity, and it's already yours. That's what's been hidden under the cross, is the real you with Jesus. In just under a minute here, Pastor, how would you sum up this chapter for us today? Yeah, just what I said there, that your life is hidden under the cross with Jesus, and he is all in all. And when you set your mind on him and his gospel by word and sacrament, then all the gifts that he has for you, which transcend in our imagination, are truly yours. Pastor Kevin Martin of Our Savior Lutheran Church in Raleigh, North Carolina, uncovering the truth of law and gospel, pointing us to Christ and reminding us of who we are in Colossians chapter 3. Pastor Martin, thank you for being our guest. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Saints of our Lord, set your minds on things that are above. And I will say this too, that if you are struggling with any of the list of things that are on that we've talked about today, the immorality, the anger, the malice, uh, lying, all those things, go to your pastor. Talk to him about what your hope is in. A reminder of who you are. And I'm serious. You can go to any of our pastors, and they're ones who will listen, who will care for you, and point you once again to Christ. Put off the old self. There is hope. There are chances. And put on the new, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is all and in all. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hands.